Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. All right, well, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for um, just for who you are, Lord. You are enough, Lord. Regardless of anything else, God, you are enough. And God, I just thank you that you are a God who um, not only created us, Lord, but, but choose us to pursue us, Lord, with your love. And I just pray, God, that you would allow us, Lord, just um, open our eyes just to understand you and your love for us. And um, like it's been shared already, with that response for your love for us, Lord, help us to love you and help us to love one another. I pray, God, that you would speak to us this morning from your word. I pray, God, that you would speak to me and fill me with your spirit, fill us with your spirit, and speak through me to your people so that your people might hear from you, not from me, Lord, but from you. To you be all the glory, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so if you were with us last week, um, you know, we have been working our way through this letter in the New Testament. It's it's a fairly small letter. It's called Ephesians, and some people refer to this as a book, book of the Bible, but really it's just a letter. Paul the Apostle is the author, and he writes this letter to his his friends who were uh, in the city of Ephesus, and so the city of Ephesus in that time, much like many of the cities today, was, was you know, had some strengths, but it also had some, um, some darkness to it, if I can use those words. I mean, there was a lot of idolatry, there was a lot of witchcraft, there was a lot of um, materialism, sexual morality. That, that's the culture that this, this city was under. And on one of the mission trips, Paul shares the gospel with a number of people and they become followers of Christ and so they they start a church in this little city and so throughout the years Paul would would write them letters and so this particular letter helps them understand that their identity is no longer in who they were but rather who God says they are now and he goes through great lengths in the very first couple of chapters to to paint a, a very dark picture of humanity what humanity is like apart from God. He uses words like, you are orphaned. You are um, someone who has no citizenship. You have no inheritance. Basically, he's letting people know, apart from God, you, you're lost. You are separated. You have no hope. But then he gives us the gospel in, in chapter 2. And he says, By, because God who is rich in mercy, he chooses us. He brings us out of this darkness and he brings us into the light. He brings us into his family and he makes us sons and daughters and he gives us an inheritance. And so this is the, the picture that the, Paul wants the church then and also us to understand today that our value comes from God and the work of his son in us, not the things of this world. Things of this world are the things we're going to pursue, but the things of this world are, 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 will leave you wanting more because it's, it's empty. We need the Lord. So, so last week we talked about marriage, and you know it's, it's a tough topic to talk about because um, some of us guys, we want to beat ourselves up because we, we want to be better husbands, or, or maybe our wives, they want 
uh, to beat us up because they want us to be better husbands. No, no, maybe some of the wives are, are feeling like, you know, I could have done things differently. And, and, you know, I want you to cut yourself some slack because we all, all are work in progress. But nevertheless, the Bible gives us instructions on how we should live our lives in the home. And I think that's important because we spend the most of our time with the people in our families. And so last week, some of the last verses of that passage that we looked at was it, Paul quotes Genesis and he says, for this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and he will be united to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And then, you know, he goes into, from that picture, he moves into parenting. But before we get into parenting, I want to just give you that picture of, of a wedding day. Many of you remember your wedding day. So whenever I do weddings and I officiate weddings, I, I stand at the front and I stand with the groom. And we are waiting for that, that door to open and here comes the bride. Everyone stands up, music starts to play, and here she comes. Here comes the bride. And she's always escorted by either her father or somebody in her life that represents a father. And as they make their way down, I ask the father or whoever is representing that father a question, and you know the question very well. I ask the question, who gives this woman away in holy matrimony? And that man will say, I do. And then he will take this woman and he will hand her over to her husband. And then he will go sit down. And that's not just a symbol. That is actually biblical because when you are married, you leave, especially the women, when you are married, you leave the, the protection, the oversight of your mother and father. When you are a child, you are under their headship. You're under their authority for 18 plus years. You are under your mother, your father's headship. But when you get married, they move into a different role, the parents do. And now the two become one flesh. And now the woman comes under the headship of her husband. And then they have kids. And those kids grow up. And 18, 19, 20, now that father is now escorting his daughter and the cycle repeats itself who gives this woman away in holy matrimony i do he hands her over and then there's this legacy that's passed down now why is this important because god has instituted the 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 home with some headship and fathers are under the headship of christ Wives, come under the headship of your husbands. Children, come under the headship of your parents. This is God's design for the family. So he, we hear words like honor and obey. And so sometimes those words are like, what? Honor and obey? You know, but this is biblical. But these are good, healthy words for us to understand. Today we're going to talk about honoring in obeying. Now, I'm going to give you the summary of my, of my sermon in like one sentence here. So if you don't remember anything else for the next 40 minutes, remember this. So when it comes to obeying in the Lord, that is whenever you are under your parents' headship as a child. You are to obey your parents and the Lord. Now, there will come a time when you leave the nest for for lack of a better word, and you go off on your own. And many of us now are older, and we either uh, have parents that are aging, or they've gone to be with the Lord. But if they are still alive, we no longer have to obey them because we're not under their headship anymore, but we still must honor them. Honor your aging parents. Honor your parents, that even if you're young. But, but when you're young, you must, according to the Scriptures, Obey. If you do not obey, there are cause and effect. And I'm not talking about getting the spanking. Everybody's like, you can't spank in these 2022. That's illegal. Okay, well then, forget I did that. But, 
But that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to if, if you don't obey your parents in the ways of the Lord, you will find consequences in this world because you will submit to some type of authority, whether it's your parents' authority or whether it's the policeman's authority or whether it's the principal or the coach at the school. Somebody is, is in authority over you. And if you choose to live a rebellious life as a young child or as a teenager, there will be cause and effect. That's just common sense. But that's typically what happens to rebellious hearts, especially teenagers, because y'all remember adults when you were a teenager, you thought you knew more than your parents. Today, they know more than us because they have the phone and they know more than us. So, but that's not how it's always been. Just because they have more information doesn't mean that they... And I don't mean to disrespect some of the younger people, but, but you'll understand someday when you get older that with age comes wisdom. And so when you're young, you have a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, but maybe not necessarily wisdom. So that being said, let's look at this passage in Ephesians. If you have your Bibles, always um, feel free to open up your Bibles. Uh, I saw somewhere on Facebook that some pastors are, have Chick-fil-A Bibles. They're closed on Sundays. Wow. That, uh. So we read from the Bible. <laughs> Ours is a digital Bible, but we are, if you ever come to this church and we preach a message and the Bible is not even proclaimed, then go to a different church. I'm just going to tell you that right now because there's no reason to come into a church to hear a motivational speaker without hearing from the Word of God. So anyways, that, that's a different sermon for a different topic, I think. But okay, Ephesians chapter 6. Let's see. Children, here it is, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on earth. Okay, so I have some words highlighted for you, and we've already talked about them briefly, but Children, obey. So young ones, obey your, does it say fathers or mothers, or does it imply parents both? So there is a dual responsibility when it comes to parenting. Fathers, we'll see, have the specific responsibility, but really it is a team approach. To, it's parenting. Husbands and wives, moms, and dads, you have a God-given right. It says that children must obey your parents in the Lord. Okay, so if they must obey the parents in the Lord, it implies that the parents have a responsibility to teach them things about God, right? If they're going to obey in the Lord, then parents first must teach them about God so they know what to obey. Because if parents don't teach them about God, then they don't know what to obey. But if they're going to obey, then they must first hear it from the parents. Now, it's interesting because Paul is not a dad. If you follow his, his life's journey, he's writing from the perspe uh, perspective of a parent, but to our knowledge, he, he doesn't have children, or at least not biological children. Now, he is a spiritual mentor to a lot of young men, in fact, he calls them his sons in the faith, Timothy and Titus, some of these guys. So even though he is not a father, he understands the role of teaching young, younger people, the next generation, about the things of God. So he goes back to the Old Testament, just like last week when it looked at marriage, he went back to Genesis chapter 2. Here, he actually goes and quotes one of the Ten Commandments. Did y'all know that was one of the Ten Commandments, honor your, your mother and your father? Okay, it says it's the first commandment with the promise, so there's a cause and effect. Now, here, Paul says that you may live a long life here on the earth, but the actual commandment doesn't say that. It says, honor your mother and father that you may live a long life as you enter into the land. It was, it was really given to the people of Israel so that when they went into the promised land, they would not live like the other nations. The other nations had all sorts of gods and their own views of life, and, and they, that's how they lived. And, and he says, no, when you get into the promised land, if you're going to live a long, prosperous life, then you need to follow my commands. 
Now, if I were to ask you to name the Ten Commandments, could you do that? Just, I mean, you don't, let me just be honest. Could you, could you name the top ten commandments? Can I, top ten, yeah, there's only ten. <laughs> At this time, the ushers are going to pass out little note cards. We're going to do a pop quiz and see if, many of you could, but how many of you think you can get them in the right order? Probably not, probably not right? We would kind of wing it. Some of you probably, yeah, I got to memorize. I, I'm good. I, you know, bring the, bring the pop quiz on. Okay, so, but let's, let's revisit this, this Ten Commandments. And I summarized them for you uh, because I couldn't get them all on my slide. But they're actually, these are the top ten. <laughs> Sorry. These are the ten. So these are the way they're listed in order. And I have them in different colors for a reason. Some of you know this. Some of you have never really thought through this. But the first four commandments really deal with our relationship with God. Look at how they are, are in order. The very first commandment, the greatest one, is to love God first. Jesus even says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. That's the greatest thing you can do. So the greatest number one commandment is to put God first. So have no other gods the only one true God. Number two, it says, don't worship any idols or any images because remember the people of, of these cultures in the promised land and even in the city of Ephesus and even here in the United States, there's all these things that our hearts want to worship. We're created to worship something and it's God. If we don't worship God, then our hearts naturally gravitate to something. And we live in a generation now where we are actually worshiping ourselves. We are the most important people to ourselves because we, teenagers especially, you grew up in a generation where you want views on your post or on your TikTok or whatever you're putting out there. You feel something I have value because people like what I'm putting out there. Or you feel like I don't have as much value because... Not many people like what I put out there. And that's a psychological thing, but it really cuts to the heart of who we are. We're not created to worship ourselves. We're not created to worship people. We're created to worship God. And so he's letting them know the number two thing is don't worship any idols. Worship me. Number three, don't misuse my name. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. He has a holy name. We are to use that name to worship. Number four, remember to rest. Because the day of rest should become a time where you stop what you're doing and worship God. But we live in a fast-paced society where we don't want to rest because we can get more done. And we don't worship God. In fact, a lot of people don't go to church anymore because they're worshiping things. And they spend all their time doing things. And God says, no, put me first. Now, if I were to say the next six commandments, if you were to list them in the order you think would be the most important, how many of you think that number, number five would be honor your mother and father? If I'm really honest, I would think, gosh, if I had to put these in order of importance, I think I'd put... Number five, you shall not murder. Because I think that's kind of more important. Don't, don't murder somebody than honor your mother and father. Followed by don't commit adultery, don't steal. And then I'd probably slide in honor your mother and father right, right above, you know, don't covet things. But that's not the way God designed it. God said, look, here's the first four is about loving me. And then I'm going to slide in number five, the importance of the home. Honor your mother and father because if the home falls apart, then the kids don't know how to love God and they're not going to know how to love their fellow citizen and they're going to murder, they're going to commit adultery, they're going to steal from each other. But the home is God's way of saying this is where it's going to be taught. And so God slides that right up to number five. And then you get down to the number 10, don't covet your neighbor's stuff. These are actually found two places in the Bible, Exodus chapter 20 and also in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So if you, um, 
you know, have been reading. Sometimes we start off in January, we're going to read through the Bible, and maybe some of you have kept it up, then you're going to eventually get to Exodus. And Exodus 20 is where we get the Ten Commandments. And if you keep reading Exodus, you're going to get a whole bunch of other laws and really details of how people should live. Now, the reason why this is important is because when God pulled his people who were slaves to Egypt out of slavery, he gives them, through Moses, his word. And he wants his people to worship him and the home to be the way he designed it and the way they treat one another. They're going to be different than the rest of the world. The rest of the world didn't have this, but God says, this is what I want them to do. Now, in Exodus uh, 20, it's mentioned, and there is a problem because if you get to the book of Numbers, so it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books of the Bible. The book of Numbers gives you a detail of them wandering around the desert. First, it, it gives you, a, they, they take a, a census and they number all the tribes. But then they get to the point where they can go into the promised land. This is the land that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they're going to go into this promised land. But before they go in, they do what many military people do. They send in, we call them spies, but they send in some people to kind of scout out the land. So they send in one person for every tribe that's represented, the 12 tribes of Israel. And they go into the promised land and they lay low for 40 days. And they're just kind of getting some intel. What's this land like? They come back and they report to the people and they report to Moses and they say, okay, here's what we discovered. This land is awesome. In fact, we have some grapes that we saw and we picked and it's not these little grapes like this. It says that they are holding a pole with a cluster of grapes and it's just so many grapes that this, they're saying this is like fertile soil. This is great land. And... There is also milk and honey. So it's a land flowing with milk and honey. The imagery should give you, when you think of milk, a lot of cattle, a lot of goats, a lot of sheep. There's so much, so much there for us. And the honey represents like cropland because there's bees pollinating everything. And there's a lot of growth. So this is great land. And everybody's like, yeah, let's go. This is our land. And they're like, but, but there's a catch. And here's the catch. There's people living in the land already, and these guys are huge. These are giants. In fact, the Jewish men are fairly small individuals, but they say, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes into them. So they're like, what are we going to do? Well, they do what every good church does. They take a vote. <laughs> that's bad. That's, that's not, that was a joke. Because anytime you start taking a vote on things, then people have opinions. And so two of the guys are like, okay, we can do this. Let's go into the promised land. God's with us. God pulled us out of Egypt. God provided for us. He gave us the, the law of Moses. He's for us. We can do this. And that guy was named Joshua. And the other guy was named Caleb. And the other guys are like, mm, gosh, you know, there's some giants in there. They're going to kill us. We're going to die. We should have like, stayed in Egypt, and we could have died in Egypt, and we brought us all the way out here to die at the hands of the giants. What are we doing? And that spread, and everybody got scared, and nobody wanted to trust God. And God said, all right, turn them around. They're 11 days, literally, from going into the, the promised land and God turns them around and said, okay, and, and you're going to wander now. And for 40 years, one day for every day they were in the promised land, they were there 40 days looking at it. For 40 years, they wandered <laughs> through the desert until every one of those people of that generation died. No one over the age, I think 56, got into the promised land including Moses, different story for a different day. That whole generation was so close, they don't go in. So full circle, before we go into the promised land, that's the book of Joshua. 
Before we go into the promised lands, you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. So Joshua was one of the guys who was faithful. He's going to succeed Moses. But before he goes into the promised land, there's the giving of the law again, a reminder of the Ten Commandments. And so it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 5, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 briefly. Okay, so if you go home and you open your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 5, you're going to see the importance of this being passed through generations. So in Genesis chapter 6, I mean, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is what it says. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Okay, let me just pause for a moment there because he is talking to the parents that are, have raised up. These, remember, the older generations died up. Now there's a new generation. And he's saying the greatest thing he's reminding them is to love God first. That's the greatest thing. But he says before you can teach them to your kids, you need to apply them to your own life. Because he says, these commandments in verse 6 that I give you today are to be not on their hearts, but on your hearts. Now, once they're on your heart, this is what parents are supposed to do. Verse 7, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. So, when were the parents supposed to talk to their kids about the things of God, these commandments about loving God? What does it say? All the time. It doesn't say Sunday morning, take them to church, drop them off. It doesn't say drop them off at the youth group. It doesn't say that. It says, in your day-to-day -day rhythms of life. Times were very much different back then. Kids actually worked alongside their parents. So when the parent would get up, and they're little, and they would go help dad, it was a one-way conversation. Dad was supposed to be teaching, and kids are supposed to be obeying. And when they would walk, because they didn't have cars, when they would walk to places, they would, hey, let's talk about things. And they would always talk about God, who God is, why he's so important. Again, when the kids are little, they're sponges. You tell them. Now, when they hit those teenage years, the conversation needs to change because kids want to ask questions. And you might remember when you were a teenager and you had questions and then your parents would say, but it's because you're supposed to do that. Well, why? Well, you're just supposed to. But why? Why do we do this? But you're just, we're, you're just supposed to. Don't ask questions. Just, just do it. But why? It's okay to ask those why questions because that, kids want to know because they're getting questions and answers about things of the world from the world. But when they come home and they ask questions you might not know the answer, but that's why it's important for us parents to learn. We can be educated. We can learn. And especially when it comes to apologetics, we need to learn some basic things because kids have some basic questions. And then not be afraid to have the dialogue and the conversation, even if that conversation gets a little little kind of like, uh, this is a little uncomfortable, but if you don't have those conversations with your teenagers, they're going to have those conversations with other teenagers, and they're going to get a worldview versus a biblical view. And that, in that includes anything from, is there a God? Is, is, you know, gender identity or sex? I mean, some of these questions we don't want to talk to our parents about, but if us as followers of Christ don't talk about these in normal rhythms, then our kids are going to find answers that are not biblically true. And let's just be honest, because we have to be honest. 
our kids are being educated with not only the schools, but with their friends and their smartphone devices. And so are us as adults. If we're not hearing from God's word, you're hearing from everyone else. And that's the tension that we live in. But he says, I want you guys to, to teach your kids to love the Lord your God. Love him with all your heart, all your soul. Talk about these things throughout your normal day. And here's the reason why. The next few verses. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, here's the warning, be careful. Be careful that you do not, what does it say? Forget the Lord. This one generation can forget the Lord because they get caught up in the, in the prosperity of this land that's flown with milk and honey and olives and vineyards and cities and huge houses. And this is like we've made it. And that's the temptation, I think, for us, many of us, because, you know, our families our grandparents struggled and worked hard and they saved and then the next generation benefited from that and then we are benefiting from that and then the next generation comes up and they can easily forget about God because they're like, why do we need God? We got all this stuff. That's called the American dream. And that's what we've been teaching our kids for generations. But this is what he says. He goes back. This is back to the Ephesian passage because remember earlier it talked about parents, but in verse 4 he gets specific. He says, parents, or I'm sorry, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and in the instruction of the Lord. That word exasperate, it also means to provoke, to make them mad. Dads are dads. I mean, I, I'm guilty of this. You know, we try to do the right thing and we end up making our kids mad. And some, sometimes it happens when they are 15 ish, 16 ish, because they are becoming men. And men naturally don't want to be confronted. And when a teenager at 15 pops off to dad, the dad bows up and, like, boy, you better not talk to me that way. And we miss it. Our role is not to confront that way. Our, our role is to, still the parent, my job is to not provoke him to anger, but to teach. Moms, probably very similar with daughters, I've been told, I don't know. But again, you have a young girl who's becoming a lady. There will be a day when they go off on their own, but while they're still under that home, there needs to be this order of headship. So... Fathers have a responsibility to train their kids up in the Lord. Here's a, some, a statistic, and here's also a homework assignment. There is a movie that I want you to watch with your family. It's a documentary. It's from the same guys who did Fireproof and Facing the Giants and uh, Overcomer and all these other movies, the, the Kendricks brothers. So this, this movie is called Show me the Father, and I think it's on Prime. But here are some statistics from this, this documentary, and it's very well done, and you're going to love it. But it says 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 71% of pregnant teens come from fatherless homes. 85% of youth in prison come from fatherless homes. Youth, are, youth from fatherless homes are 32 times more likely to become runaways. These are just basic statistics that they found from, from you know, fatherless homes. Now, the question is, where are these dads? And I don't know, but I was just thinking about this, and I 
here's a couple of thoughts that came to my mind. Maybe some of those dads have died. And these kids have grown up without a father figure. Maybe, maybe some of these, um, these dads want to live the single life. And they don't want to be a dad. They want to make babies, but they don't want to be a husband, and they don't want to be a father. And without going down too far down this road, I do believe my own personal opinion, I believe that there are laws in place that encourage this, that frustrates me. Because there are women who don't want to get married because they get certain benefits from the government. And if they get married, they'll lose their benefits. And so there's this cycle that a a guy is like, okay, you don't want to marry me? Okay, no problem. And then they'll have a baby. And then there's no father present. And there's the breakdown of the home. And then that kid grows up and he has no father figure and he gets into this cycle that, hey, government's going to take care of us, and so he repeats the process, he or she. And this 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 is a statistic that happens. And it's frustrating because that's not God's plan. God's plan has always been for the father to stay in the home and to raise his daughters and raise his sons and to be a husband. But not that's not always the case, unfortunately. Then, of course, the cycle, according to those statistics, they end up in jail because they end up not knowing how to love God, not knowing how to honor mom and dad because no dad's there, and they join a gang, and then they they steal something, and they get caught and put in jail. There's another cycle. And this is a thing that's happening in our culture. But the last one, I think, really hits home to me because I'm not in jail. I want to be a dad. And I'm present, quote unquote, in my home. However, and I think this might apply to some of us today, but some fathers who are in the home are not really in the home because they are spending all their time and energy chasing the American dream, providing for their kids. They're still married. They're still going to the Little League games every so often, but they're too busy furthering their career and building a bigger good legacy for their kids financially, but they're not home with the kids when the kids need them. And you see, in in really um, nice cities like Plano, Texas, I remember in the late 1990s, I was in Denton, Texas, and there was a high number of teen suicide coming from very wealthy, affluent families because these kids had everything. They just didn't have mom and dad around. And so you can have all those things, but you still need a father present in the lives of your kids. Now, this is something, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on, but but this is something that has hit hard to me as a father. I got kids that are 24 all the way down to 12, and so I've been able to actually parent two different sets of kids when I go to the Little League game, I'm sitting there with all the, they think I'm the grandparent. You know, like, which one's your kid? I'm like, which one's your grandkid? I was like, that's actually my kid. He's like, they look at me like, oh, okay. But when I was younger, I worked two jobs, and I went to seminary. And I did that off and on for seven years. And my young, well, my oldest now, but the time Josh was my only child, in his early days of, of, he would say, Daddy at work, Daddy's at school, Daddy's at work, Daddy's at school. We would go to the movie theater and we would watch whatever cartoon was out there and I would sleep because I was exhausted from doing school and working. Now, I wish I could go back and do things differently with him and with justice because I feel like I was so busy doing stuff for the Lord and I was but I wish I would have slowed down to really spend time with them. Now, my two younger ones, I have another shot at it. And so we are, I'm trying to to be present there. And maybe some of you dads or moms feel like that's happened to you. If you have little ones, 
don't let this window close. You have some time with them. But if they are already teenagers and up, you're going to have to change the relationship, but still work on being present. And maybe even ask for forgiveness. Because maybe you, we all wish we could have done things differently. Wisdom comes with age. If I knew now what I, what I wish I'd have known then, that doesn't make sense. If I knew now, never mind. I wish I knew then what I know now. But I can't go back in time. I can only move forward. And so even as someday when I have grandchildren, maybe some of you have grandchildren, you have another opportunity to pour into the next generation. And maybe some of you just need to focus on maybe your aging parents. Because maybe you haven't, you've been a good son and daughter, but now is a time where you need to honor them and maybe help them out as they're aging. This is life, and life is messy. But nevertheless, God is still for us. And I do believe God loves us, and God is the perfect father, and God is the father to the fatherless, and God is the one who wants you, if you don't know him in a personal way, to come into the, his family through his son, Jesus. All you have to do to come into the family of God is believe that you are a sinner and that you need a savior to forgive you of all your sins. And there's only one person that can do that. And his name is Jesus. And for me, when I was 24 years old, I said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord, just please forgive me for all my sins, but especially some really big ones that I'm carrying. And the Lord forgave me. And, and yesterday, my, my kids and I were, my two youngest ones and I and my wife were, we were sitting around the table having dinner and, you know, God has convicted me and I'm like, gosh, I'm preaching about parenting and I should, maybe we should have a Bible study. And I was like, no, but that just sounds too hard. We're going to have a Bible study, kids. And I'm like, no. So I was like, hey, you know what? Because they all have phones. And I'm like, hey, let's look in that Bible, that phone that you got and, and let's, let's, whatever y'all want to talk about. And so my daughter said, how about Esther? All right, let's look at Esther. And so we began to read and our conversation, conversation, that's the key took us down a journey of me and, you know, really just confessing some things to them that I believe God wanted me to share with them so that they could understand the love of a father and the love that God the Father has for me and then also for them. What I was confessing is nothing but my previous life when I came to know the Lord. And so... That's what, I, that's what I really believe God is wants for us, is that we are loving our kids and having those conversations, and we're not perfect parents, but we're pointing them to Jesus. Because I do believe God wants to bless you and me, regardless of what we've done. And that's why he wants us to come under his headship. So I'm going to just ask the worship team to come up in this closing song, and you know, I was telling Pastor John, I said, you know, last week I spoke on marriage, and I just, I felt like, gosh, that was kind of a heavy sermon, and, you know, if you guys need some prayer, we want to pray for you, and we don't want to make you feel like, you know, you are the only ones that need prayer, but if you need prayer, this is a safe place, and if we can have maybe one or two people on the sides that are on the prayer team, if you just need prayer, you don't have to go into a lot of specific. Just, just, just maybe God is working in an area of your life and you just want some prayer. But, or maybe you just want to sit there and just bef quietly before God, just spend some time with him and let him speak to you because his word is spoken and it will not return void. And our job now is to ask the Holy Spirit just to help us to apply it and to live it out. So I'm going to pray and then turn it over to the team. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for your son, your only begotten son who demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, uh, you loved us. And Lord, I think of the prodigal. Many sons, including ourselves, we run at times. But you're a good father who is steadfast and waiting for us to return. And Lord, you want us, you want to bless not only us, but the next generation and the next generation, Lord. And that just doesn't happen, Lord. It happens when we let you into our homes. And so, Lord, you are welcome in our homes. You're welcome in this church. 
We ask all these things, Jesus, in your name.